Okay, our next talk is all about CT dose reduction in the abdomen and pelvis. I'm happy to introduce to you Eric Paulson. He's our new uh, one of our new department chairs at MD Anderson, and he's going to do a great job with this. Well, good morning. It's a uh, pleasure and true delight uh, to be here, and I'm uh, really pleased that the AAPM invited me, and, and uh, Diana Cody extended a personal invitation uh, for me to come give this talk. I, I must say, though, I feel a little bit uh, like uh, I'm taking uh, Coles to Newcastle to sell uh, in the 1600s, uh, because I think you all know all of this stuff already. Uh, but uh, let's see, let's see what uh, we can do. I'd like to thank uh, several individuals um, who have, uh, over the years, I've learned from and borrowed material from, and they're listed on this slide. And in particular, I've borrowed some slides for this talk from uh, Rendon Nelson, who, who just uh, gave the last talk. What I'd like to do is uh, to give uh, an overview uh, of some issues around radiation dose. And uh, I'd also um, talk a like to talk about some specific initiatives uh, to decrease dose uh, in abdominal and pelvic CT. And some of those initiatives uh, are ways to decrease dose with no change in image quality whatsoever. And some of those are ways to decrease dose that do affect uh, image quality um, and either using a widely available technology which is uh, installed uh, throughout the country or using newer technology, uh, which has uh, recently become available. Of course, the issue here uh, is that is that X-ray photons can cause double strand breaks in DNA, which can give rise to point mutations, which can, at least in theory, give rise to mutations in cells that can give rise to cancer. And if you buy that theory, it only takes, in theory, one X-ray photon or just a few X-ray photons to induce such a mutation. So if you buy that idea, we need to be particularly cognizant around any radiation dose or any X-ray dose. It's not my mission this morning to get into the uh, threshold theories uh, and so on around low dose or radiation. Uh, but suffice it to say, I think in terms of patient safety, uh, we need to assume that we need to do everything we can uh, to mitigate dose uh, in a reasonable uh, fashion. Having said that, I think this is an important graph that we may lose uh, sight of. The, it basically looks at the, uh, the yellow bars, uh, look at the distribution of the population by age. And so, for example, this yellow bar looks at... Uh, uh, kids up to 10 years of age, this is uh, 20 to 30, this is uh, 50 to 60, and this is over 80. And you can see the normal bell-shaped distribution, and it's kind of humbling to me to, for me to realize personally that I'm on the down slope of that curve. I, that never happened to me before. It just dawned on me uh, just recently. The, bl the, the blue bars uh, look at the uh, distribution of CT scans by age. And so a take-home message is that you know, only about 20% of our population is older than 55 years of age, yet that is the group that receives the vast majority of CT scans. That is the group that we're less concerned about with radiation dose. We're most concerned about the young patients, and particularly young kids and young females. So just keep that in mind as we have these uh, conversations in our various uh, facilities. It's an important thing to consider. Is there a risk from uh, a CT scan? I think yes, but I think it's small. I think it's very difficult to quantify. Um, clearly, as you've heard this week, and you already know, and you'll hear again, that the risk is greatest in our young patients, in, our, in, our, in women, and particularly young females. The study to specifically answer how risky a single CT scan is will never be done. There's no way we're going to line up uh, 30,000 people and give 15,000 of them uh, 15 millisieverts of radiation and 15 
15,000 of them nothing and follow them for the next 20 years. That's just not ever going to happen. But um, although the epidemiologic data around low dose is a little inconclusive and confusing, I think there's mounting evidence that even a few CT scans, particularly in our youngest patients, can have a negative effect. And I'm referring to some of the data that came out of the United Kingdom a year ago looking at the effects of just a few head CTs uh, to populations of patients who were followed subsequently, sort of direct observational data of an increased incidence in malignancy in those patients who may have had just as, many, as few as three head CTs. I think it's really important that as we think about this in our hospitals and in our, in our practice safety committees, uh, that uh, as the former slide pointed out, that CT radiation in general is applied to a selected uh, older population with suspected or known disease. And I think we lose sight of that when we have conversations about radiation dose. If you're a middle-aged man uh, with colon cancer and you get a CT scan to stage the colon cancer and you've got a subtle 5-millimeter metastasis, if we drop our doses so low that we lose our ability to pick up that single metastasis, which could be resected for cure or ablated for cure, we've done that person a huge disservice. We need to be able to find those lesions in those patients. So it's very important that we apply dose reduction techniques wisely and appropriately. And it's very important that when you consider our use of CT, we hope that we're applying CT uh, to rule in or rule out a suspected disease which may be life-threatening, which will drive therapeutic decisions, which outweigh, almost always, if done well, the low, low risk uh, from radiation. I think it's also true that in patients with limited survival, I mean, let's talk about intensive care unit patients or patients with stage 4 uh, non-curable uh, metastatic disease, worrying about dose from CT or dose from radiation around imaging uh, is kind of a waste of time uh, because it's not going to impart uh, any deleterious effect on those patients, uh, unfortunately. So keep those principles in mind when you have those conversations uh, in your hospital. A lot of things are already happening around uh, dose reduction. Cynthia McCullough, who many of you know, has this excellent article, which I will commend to you, called In Defense of Body CT, published in AJR a few years ago. And it looks uh, at the various uh, decades, uh, 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, early 2000s, and looks at the typical dose from body CT. These dates predate our real concern about radiation from CT, yet the vendors have, through their regular good practices, have developed techniques to keep dose coming down and down and down. So really kind of without doing anything aggressively, the vendors and the new technology has had a stepwise uh, diminution in dose. And if you were to take this out to 2013, at least in many of our practices, uh, dose has gone even lower. So I suspect that this chart needs to be redone looking at data from modern day uh, technology. And this is true even though uh, slice thickness keeps getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So in a way we're kind of scanning more and more and more, yet we're doing so at slightly lower dose. So things are happening sort of without us even trying aggressively uh, to do anything about it. There are other things we can do that are just easy and make a lot of sense. Um, we, we need to uh, reduce the number of scans in clinical scenarios where CT is unnecessary. If you're on the clinical side, it is, it's been frustrating since I was in medical school to be aware of the overutilization of imaging, and it continues, and it continues in spades, and we really need to get our arms around that. Or we do follow-up studies uh, using CT where another modality without radiation might be perfectly efficacious. Here's a patient with metastatic disease to the liver, let's call it stage 4 colon cancer. 
Uh, we, could, we could follow that patient's liver mets with ultrasound just fine. We tend not to do that at many of our practices, but it would be one approach. Or lots of patients who have uh, inpatient uh, abdominal radiographs that show uh, ileus or small bowel obstruction have a recommendation to get a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, probably not necessary in that scenario uh, to get a CT scan. So I think we're over utilizing imaging. There's no question about it. Well, the other thing is that we can decrease dose without changing image quality at all uh, by decreasing the number of CT images on a per exam base, basis uh, with less anatomic coverage, for example, or fewer phases. And so let me talk about um, uh, this in, in a little bit uh, more detail. Back to this reduction of unnecessary uh, CT scans. I'm an abdominal imager and have an interest uh, in the uh, pancreas. And here's an example of pancreatitis. You know, it turns out you don't need a CT scan to make the diagnosis of pancreatitis. There's a characteristic pain pattern, a characteristic clinical presentation, characteristic lab values. And uh, while all of those patients get CT scans, you don't really need a CT scan to make the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. Now, if you're going to look for complications of pancreatitis, yes, you do. But in all of our hospitals, patients with suspected pancreatitis almost always get a uh, CT scan. Or we do lots of imaging uh, uh, when the physical examination hasn't even been completed or when laboratory tests aren't even back or if you have a busy emergency department. Emergency departments are all about throughput. CT enhances throughputs for emergency departments even before a patient is seen by a physician or by a physician extender. Uh, a requisition for a CT scan is dropped. And one of the names of games, one of the names of the game to be successful in radiology departments is to scan as quickly as possible, put the results on the chart as quickly as possible. And our job is predicated on that. So we have a complicated system uh, around uh, the utilization uh, of uh, imaging. We have this uh, image creep. Uh, that is to say, uh, for years, uh, we've taught our technologists by all means, don't exclude important anatomy from the field of view or from your coverage. And that's an important principle. They don't want to be called out on a scan that is inadequate. I get that. So one of the ways to get around that, of course, is to be a little bit generous and start a little bit high and scan a little bit low. So in the abdomen, for example, uh, if you start scanning too high above the diaphragm, uh, you're going to inappropriately radiate the breast. So here's an abdomen and pelvis scan where it wasn't until the eighth image that we actually got to the top of the diaphragm. There were eight images that had breast scattered irradiation that wasn't uh, even uh, necessary or scanning well into the proximal thighs uh, down in the pelvis or through the scrotum uh, in the, uh, or in the proximal thighs or through the scrotum, which has a similar implication uh, as well. Uh, this is mainly a technologist issue, and it's, uh, it, 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 it encourages us to make sure we're communicating with our technologists in a regular way. We've also added phases, and I'll tell you that my former group at Duke was responsible for, for popularizing many of these phases. We need to ask ourselves just what, is it, what specifically do we gain from an additional phase. My current practice, which is now at MD Anderson, has tons of additional phases uh, on almost all of our protocols. And we really need to ask ourselves critically when we do a dual phase liver or a triple phase liver or a quadruple phase liver or delayed images through the pelvis or five minute delays through the liver or 10 minute delays through the liver, what are we specifically gaining from those additional phases? Just because we can do those things doesn't necessarily mean we should. You know, one uh, kind of uh, easy way to deal with the problem of wanting to scan the kidneys during the nephrographic phase where the renal parenchyma enhances nicely, but also being able to visualize the collecting systems nicely is to combine those two phases together so you have an acquisition where the uh, collecting system is well opacified, the renal parenchyma is well seen, and if you're working up hematuria, you kind of answer all those questions at once. That specific protocol would require giving a small dose of intravenous contrast, waiting five or seven minutes for that contrast to be excreted into the collecting system, 
and then giving the remainder of the contrast to image during the nephrographic phase. We need to think of creative ways to do that sort of thing in our practice. Or, here's some data uh, that came um, from Doug Schaefer uh, at uh, Duke from a long time ago. And we looked at the additive value of a non-contrast phase, an arterial phase, and a portal venous phase in the liver. And I won't bore you with all of the details, but suffice it to say that if you ask the question, how many metastases are uniquely seen on a pre-contrast phase or an arterial phase or a portal venous phase, turns out on both the non-contrast phase and the arterial phase, we don't see that many metastases uniquely. Uh, and so it really begs the question, why would you do a pre and arterial and portal venous phase in patients uh, with breast cancer? Here's an example of such a patient where the arterial phase proved to be helpful. Pre-contrast scan, I don't see any lesions. On the portal venous phase, I wouldn't see any lesions. But on the arterial phase, there's a rash of lesions in the liver. Just as an example, uh, we need to be very careful about which phases we choose and which phases we exclude. Based on this data, that group decided to eliminate the pre-contrast phase in patients with breast cancer. I can tell you at my current practice, the group feels really strongly that pre-contrast scans through the liver are absolutely critical for our practice in a cancer care center. Or this patient also has a four-phase scan. This is a hepatocellular carcinoma growing into the portal vein. And we need to very carefully ask ourselves, you know, now, you know, in a patient with end-stage cirrhosis, it probably doesn't matter if we're radiating, but we need to ask ourselves, do we really need four CT scans of the liver to make that uh, diagnosis uh, in these patients? Uh, or in this case, and this is a case I borrowed from uh, Rendon Nelson, and uh, it uh, shows the um, unenhanced phase, the arterial phase, portal venous phase, and equilibrium phase, and there is an enhancing hepatocellular carcinoma, which is right there, and it's classic for that disease. You don't see it on the pre-contrast scan, don't really appreciate it on the portal venous phase scan. You see it nicely on this delayed equilibrium scan, and you see two other lesions which are sort of uniquely identified. Maybe you see this one on the arterial phase, uniquely identified on this delayed equilibrium phase. The point of all of that is I think we need to be very careful uh, about uh, choosing the appropriate number of phases in our scans. And I think it's actually pretty ironic that in the liver, even though we've pushed for faster and faster imaging technology on CT and MR, it's looking at, like for hepatocellular carcinoma, perhaps the single best phase is an old five or seven minute delayed scan through the liver answers many of the questions that we need to know. Or some practices like to image the pelvis after all the contrast gets into the urinary bladder. And that's just, uh, that's just the way it is. And I think it relates to the fact that uh, people grew up uh, looking at the bladder using cystography and intravenous urography. Well, I actually think you can see the bladder better without contrasting it at all. I think uh, enhancing lesions and mucosal-based lesions are seen easier if you just simply have the non-enhanced uh, urine in the bladder. Many practices have that additional delayed scan. I don't think it adds much to, to the practice much at all. Now, Fred Lee and his group up at Wisconsin did a pretty interesting uh, sort of uh, survey. They looked at the um, added ionizing radiation uh, using unindicated uh, multiphase uh, scans. And they went to the ACR appropriateness criteria uh, for a variety of recommended scans relative to indication, and they surveyed a bunch of practices uh, based on what they do for specific indications. And without going through all the details, they found that many, many sites do additional series, additional phases that are not recommended by the ACR. Now, the ACR is not necessarily the final answer on what protocol we should use, but I think the point of this article is that many sites are probably over-phasing, over-irradiating, doing additional sequences that probably have very little added value. And they did a calculation that if, if simply the ACR criteria were followed, uh, that a, me whoopsie, a mean effective dose of uh, uh, 26 millisieverts on average could be reduced to 18 millisieverts if they simply uh, 
went by the ACR criteria alone. I think it's our tendency to overdo as opposed to being a little bit leaner and meaner around the utilization of, a different, of, different, of a additional phases. Or how about this concept? Here is a uh, young person uh, with missed appendicitis who's got an appendiceal abscess. And actually, it's kind of neat. That little high attenuation focus is probably the little stone in the appendix that caused appendicitis in the first place. So missed appendicitis turned into an abscess. And uh, we drained uh, that patient uh, percutaneously using uh, CT fluoroscopy. Well, what will happen is this patient will come back for subsequent CT scans to make sure that catheter is in appropriate position and that the abscess has eventually gone away. What will happen is we will rescan that patient with an abdomen and pelvis CT scan every time they come down typically. That's the routine protocol. What actually probably makes more sense is for us to just scan where the abscess was to answer that question. Now, there's no specific billing for that. We, if you, you have to charge for an abdomen, you have to charge for a pelvis, and there's criteria, so we have some work to do to do that. But it makes all the sense in the world, I think, to, appro to approach patients with that sort of philosophy uh, moving forward, particularly in young patients like this in whom radiation is uh, an issue. Um, there are ways to decrease dose by adjusting KV that Dr. Nelson talked about last time and also decreasing uh, MA. And uh, these, uh, these uh, changes don't really require a state-of-the-art modern scanner that has all the bells and whistles uh, on them. Um, uh, as we learned last time, uh, KVP and dose is a quadratic equation. So if you decrease KVP from, say, 140 to 120, that represents a 20% diminution in dose to the patient, whereas with MA, uh, it's uh, linear. So if you were to decrease your MA from like 300 to 220, uh, that would be a 27% uh, decrease in dose. And so, you know, what is, how does this work in reality? Well, if you're, if you're in the southeastern part of the United States, either all the way down to Texas and including in Arizona, we're in the so-called stone belt. And we scan a lot of patients with flank pain uh, to look for stones. And nice things about stones, of course, is that they're very high attenuation compared to the background soft tissue. You don't need a very juicy scan to diagnose a stone in the collecting system. So here's an image with an MA of 380. Here's the same image with a simulated MA of 70. And you can see that stone just fine. So I think if we're working up stones and suspected stones, dropping the MA to decrease the dose makes a lot of sense, particularly when you consider that a lot of those patients are fairly young. And if you were to do that in this case, go from 380 down to 70, that would be about an 82% diminution in dose. Now, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Uh, because here is an image uh, at 180 right here in the pelvis, pretty darn noisy, and there is no, there's no calcification in the collecting system or the distal ureters, but there is this little calcification in the peripheral aspect of the uterus right there. And a small stone in the ureters would look just like that. But if you simply, but if you go down to 130 MA, you're not going to see that calcification. Let's pretend it's in the ureter, for example, where it would make a difference. And if you go down to 70 MA, you're not going to see that calcification at all. In fact, at 70 MA, you see a bunch of bright white spots, and you wonder if those were calcifications. And so it's a, we have to be cognizant and careful as we drop the dose and make sure we don't go too far. You know, if we, if we scan with such low dose that the image quality is so bad and we don't make the right diagnosis, that's over-radiating as well. We've done a disservice to patients if we do that. Or this case, 130 MA, 40 MA, 20 MA, no problem finding that particular stone right there. So clearly, in the workup of suspected renal stones, low-dose technique makes all the sense in the world. But how about for acute appendicitis? We looked at this uh, at Duke uh, before I left. Here is a child with acute appendicitis uh, with a routine dose and no trouble making that diagnosis at all. Uh, but if we uh, decrease the dose by 25%, uh, dropping the MA, I think you can still make the diagnosis of acute appendicitis with confidence and you'd be just fine. But how about this? How about if we drop the dose by 75%, now all of a sudden the image is so noisy 
then I don't think uh, we'd be able to make the diagnosis with confidence as all, at all. So when we approach these problems, we need to be very careful and make sure we don't go too low. You've heard about Smart Prep and Care Bolus uh, already, uh, which of course is uh, automatic adjustment of the MA based on the body part that is being scanned. Uh, Dr. Kalra has shown very nicely from several years ago now that if we apply that technology, we can clearly uh, decrease uh, dose uh, based on the specific noise indexes that you choose. And I think most of us are applying that technology in our practices. Um, using breast shields, while controversial, I think makes some sense. Um, they're cheap, they're reusable, uh, they attenuate uh, extra radiation, uh, and they're well tolerated by patients, and many practices use them as a routine. I should say um, that the, the reason they work is that the uh, curves of lead and bismuth in terms of x-ray attenuation are almost identical because their atomic number is almost identical. I will say this, though. Use of breast shields is somewhat controversial. Some have simply argued, take the breast shield off, drop the MA through the mediastinum, image quality will be just fine, and in fact, you can achieve even lower dose uh, by doing it that way. And so, you know, different practices to do different things, but uh, at uh, where we are, we use breast shields as a routine. This was implied uh, last time. Um, in general, uh, Clearly, if you uh, want to decrease dose, you want to increase the table speed a little bit, so go with higher pitch. You want to decrease the rotation time as much as you can, so choose faster rotations. That's pretty obvious uh, to an audience uh, like this. Now, there's some new technologies as well that I will just highlight uh, that also um, can give rise to dose. And I will tell you that um, these technologies, I think, are really confusing and really difficult to implement. And uh, they were. Diff I've recently trans uh, left Duke University to come to MD Anderson, and at both sites, it was difficult to roll out the new technology. And the reason it's difficult is is that first of all, they're complicated for me, at least. They're a little hard to understand, and there's a change in image quality. And radiologists who've grown up looking at a particular noise distribution for all their training and all their practice. If you mess with that noise distribution, they immediately assume it's a deficient image. And it's a very difficult hurdle for most practices to get over. And we've, that was a challenge at Duke, and it's an even bigger challenge at MD Anderson. These new technologies do decrease dose. There's no question about it. They do create a different imaging appearance, which we're going to have to get used to. They are costly. Uh, they do have a little penalty in terms of reconstruction time, but not much. And they do require new expense. They do require new scanners uh, that are expensive, but they're beginning to populate uh, throughout our practices. Um, one way to get similar image quality at much lower radiation dose is to use iterative reconstruction, which can drop dose up to about 50 percent. Another way is to use model-based iterative. Those are the GE names. Model-based iterative reconstruction, which can decrease dose up to about 75 percent. These technologies improve data sets that are inherently noisy, it can be useful for large patients, can be useful for what can be noisy CT angi angiogram scans, and can be useful for dual energy and low KV scans. And they clearly result in better image quality at lower radiation doses. I'm going to show a series of slides that were uh, borrowed, um, and I've given people credit that I've borrowed them from. They also come from the literature as well as some brochures um, from the vendors. So here is uh, one from Amy Hera here in Phoenix. And it uh, looks at a low-dose scan, and here's the filtered back-projected back image, and here's the same data set with application of ACER, and, there is, and it's a low-dose scan overall with an MAS of only 86, but clearly a nice recovery of image quality from that noisy filtered back-projection scan. So, for example, consider the lower pole of the left kidney. You can't diagnose that, that stone, but uh, with the ACER applied, you'll see that stone in that particular uh, patient. Or this one from Dr. Kalra. Uh, this is an attenuation corrected image from PET, a terrible image using the filtered back projection, uh, but at least in terms of attenuation correction, 
uh, and uh, at least in terms of trying to get information out of that noise using MBIR on the right, at least you have a much better image, albeit far from uh, perfect. And this was a remarkably low dose uh, technique of an MAS of only 10. Uh, here's another one. Um, filter back projection on the left, iterative reconstruction on the right, uh, MAS of 75, and uh, nice uh, increase in image quality uh, with the uh, iterative uh, reconstruction. Uh, or this one. Uh, check out the uh, right adrenal. Uh, uh, the right adrenal has an adenoma or a cyst within it right there that you completely lose uh, looking at the filtered back projection uh, image uh, alone. Uh, or this one also from Dr. Kolra. Uh, check out the uh, vascular lesion in the liver, which is probably a hemangioma, uh, seen to much better advantage uh, with the model-based uh, iterative reconstruction. Or check out the appearance of the uh, valvuli conoventes uh, in the uh, small bowel um, with the filtered back projection. You can't really appreciate them, but you see them quite nicely here. Now, I'll tell you, that's all true. I think it's a better image, but radiologists, there's a look to the, to the, to the iterative reconstructive, the MBIR iterative reconstruction, model-based iterative reconstruction, images that is, that is unattractive or unappealing uh, to many uh, radiologists. And I suspect that if you've implemented this in your practice, you've heard that kind of criticism. We certainly have heard that uh, at uh, MD Anderson. Another example here. And here, where there's a very small peripheral liver lesion right here that you see to much better advantage um, with these modern uh, reconstruction techniques. Here's one from my current practice. This is work that Eric Tam and Diana Cody and others are working on. And it's a very noisy, uh, low-dose uh, low image on your left of the pelvis, um, but then the same image uh, with uh, iterative with uh, model-based iterative reconstruction applied. And there's no question that the uh, noise is, is different and the noise is better, um, but the appearance of the image is fundamentally uh, changed as well. And this speckled appearance with the, with the noise pattern um, without the model-based iterative reconstruction, I think is within radiologist's comfort zone and trying to get comfort with the MBIR I think has been difficult at least uh, at MD, MD Anders. So in, so in conclusion, I think there's a plethora of strategies to decrease dose. Um, I think we have to be very smart about those. Uh, many of these steps are easy and free and can be implemented right away in your practices. Our vendors are on board and they're helping us get our doses down. Societies like this are helping us get our doses down. And I think there's the benefit of the benefit of indicated and thoughtfully performed CT clearly outweighs the small risk. Thank you very much.